Thank you. <clears throat> I've, uh, I've been working for the New York Times for 18 years, and in that time, I've covered a lot of, um, a lot of conflict, a lot of war, um, Afghanistan, Iraq, uh, Gaza, Lebanon, various wars in Africa, uh, Syria, and Libya, which uh, in my introduction, uh, as you heard, I was captured by forces uh, loyal to Gaddafi at the time. Um, they, at the time of capture, they executed my driver. Uh, we were dragged across the desert, um, put in various jails, jails beaten, threatened. Um, so the job comes with a lot, of, uh, a lot of hard times, but that's where you have to be in order to see the hard times of those that you're covering. Um, there's no magic force field around you when you're out there doing this work. Of all those places that I mentioned, Yemen, which you can see here, Sana, has one of the worst humanitarian disasters that I've ever seen of all the places that I've been. Uh, it's a very, very difficult place to go. There, it's very underreported and underphotographed because you need visas, permissions. It's a, uh, you can't just go there. There are no commercial flights to the capital. Um, and once you're in the country, uh, it's, it, it's a whole new set of problems. Um, in the north, you have ISIS. In the south, you have Al-Qaeda. Um, you have uh, warring sides, one in the north backed by Iran, in the south backed by Saudi Arabia, and a lot of other groups that are fighting each other there. It's a complicated conflict, but the underlying thing here is that people, the civilians, are the ones that are suffering the most out of this conflict because of the embargoes that are happening uh, surrounding the, 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 how isolated Yemen is makes it very difficult for anything to get in for these people. As you can see here, um, women have to walk miles at times to get enough drinking water, uh, which is rationed every day to, uh, for their families, which is often not enough. Um, these are Houthi fighters in the north. And this is an interesting conflict because I was able to actually cover both sides. I was able to cross from one group to the next, right across the front line, and literally the fighters come together and hand us to, to the next group. So I've never experienced that before. But going around Yemen, it's, uh, you know, it's just logistically very difficult to travel around. As you can see, um, you know, the, 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 the Saudi-led bombardment of cities like here, um, it leaves people with very little places to live and forces them into living in uh, 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 camps for displaced people. And in those camps, there is no clean water, cholera outbreaks, disease, lack of food. Um, here we are in the south with uh, uh, Yemeni fighters loyal to the government. And when you arrive in a place like Yemen or any of these countries, you don't know what to expect when you haven't ever been there before. You know, a lot of people say, like, how do you even get up to those front lines? How do you find the, uh, uh, how to communicate with people? And it is very complicated. Um, when you arrive, you get off the plane or off out of the car, and you're, you're just, I don't speak the language, I have to find a translator. These things aren't often, most of the time, are not in, uh, organized in advance, um, and you have to learn how to read people. Who can you trust? Who can, you know, is your driver trustworthy? Is your translator trustworthy? You put your life in their hands. They're one phone call away from anything you can imagine in these places. The civilians, the elderly, uh, children, 
they're constantly being hit by shrapnel, killed by shrapnel, uh, mortars, gunfire, and disease. The fighters, often, most of these guys are forced into fighting. Despite being combatants, many of them have never seen their 17th birthday and never will, such as this young man who was shot in the chest in the port area of Hudeda last year. It's one of the most interesting places I've worked because the people are actually so friendly and in a lot of ways very understanding about why we're there as Western journalists. When It's not like we're there with hundreds of other journalists and they're used to seeing you around. They, you get there and you're the, I, you don't see another foreigner the entire time. We were there for a month. I never saw another foreigner, only Yemeni people. But they welcome you um, no matter what side you're on. And everyone has you know, their case to why this conflict is bad in their point of view. And that is what we try to do, is see it from both sides. I, I, I've, I've seen this conflict from both sides. And the bottom line is that everyone suffers. Lack of housing. Uh, here are people living in an... Uh, camp for displaced people, and, the, and the, to the left there in the back, that's their home. They barely have enough pieces of plastic to cover themselves from the elements. It, it's really one of, at the same time, I know this may sound strange, but it's one of my favorite places to work just because it's about the people, it's about the, 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 the personality and uh, the how people receive me and how I'm able to, to show something that is so hard to show. It's not like going somewhere in Europe or even many places in the Middle East where you can, you can pretty much just get on a plane and go. Like this takes many months to organize to go there. And when you get in, you really feel a responsibility that this is a, something, this is an opportunity to show something that otherwise isn't shown. And that's really the core of what I want to be doing as a photojournalist, because those pictures need to speak to an audience and need to make an impression. As I spent time there, um, you know, one of the things about being a photojournalist for me, you know, I have my daily responsibilities. I'm, I'm a newspaper photographer. I have to every day send pictures. There's going to be a story. The story go, my, my pictures go with that reporter's story. But for me, I want to find that one picture that, that really says something about the entire conflict, a metaphor for the entire conflict. And that wouldn't necessarily, it's very rarely is a, 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 a violent photo or an action-packed photo, but you never know what it is going into it. I went to a small clinic in the north. Uh, the north is where most of the uh, uh, malnutrition among children is happening. <clears throat> and when I arrived, it was just this little building in a compound, typical place. Didn't look like anyone even worked there. No cars in the parking lot. Dusty, very hot out. And I thought, you know, here's another day where I'm not going to be able to find anything to show what's happening. As I walked in, I looked around in these rooms, and I could see that there were, every single room was filled with children in this condition, skeletal, dying. Even while I was there, every 45 minutes to an hour, another desperate family would come in with a, with a child. I, I couldn't even conceive of how this child could be alive, they were so small at times. And I spent two days in this clinic, and I, I just going from room to room, place to place, photographing these children. I just, I started a family late. I have a two-year-old and a seven-month-old, and, and especially even looking at these pictures now, 
have a different effect on me now that I'm a father. It, it, it's hard for me to even think about not only them, but how this affects their families. Uh, and in talking about that one image, this is, for me, the photograph that summed up that entire trip. Months and months of planning, a month in country, working every day, going to front lines, traveling 12 hours in a car, driving around, dealing with everything you can imagine, getting sick. Uh, Amal, seven years old, young girl who uh, was just laying motionless on a cot among all these other children. Something about her just stopped me in my tracks. And as a photographer, a newspaper photographer, you know, I'm very used to things happening quickly. I'm running in and out of buildings. I'm I, moving quickly, fast. Things are always unraveling. And it's easy to get distracted. It's easy to just want to go from A to B to C to D and, and get it all. My biggest weakness is not stopping. And in this case, I stopped. I stopped with this girl for hours. And she was motionless the entire time. I photographed her hands. I photographed her face. I photographed her from back when she was with her mother. And I settled on this image. Her laying there, you know, if you, if you don't look at her body, if you just look at her face, she looks just like a sweet young child. And then you look down and you see this absolutely heartbreaking body that she's left with. To me, it looks like she's just holding on to what's left of her body with her hands. She never moved. Her mother never objected to having the photos made. The photograph, I knew, I knew that this was going to be an important photograph. Uh, it was shown on the floor of the Senate. It ran on the front page of the New York Times. Um, it, it, it meant a lot to me to be able to share with people this is what war is. Not the front lines, not the bad guys, this. After we left the clinic, we were staying five or six hours away. You know, often, as a journalist, you never, you know, you go and you, you, know, you never know what happens to the people. You go to another place, you know, they don't have electricity, they don't have a phone, they don't have anything. They, they live in a, in a camp. Um, we learned through the clinic, through someone there, that she had been discharged. And both Declan Walsh, the New York Times correspondent, and I were relieved. We thought you know, that she'd been discharged and she'd gone back to the camp where she had been living with her family. And we thought, that's, that's wonderful. Turns out that she was discharged because the clinic could not take care of her. They did not have the medicine or the equipment to help this young child. They told the family to take her 15 miles away to a better equipped clinic. Her family didn't have enough money or the means to get her 15 miles away. So they went two miles away to their village. Three days later, Amal died. That really is something that hurt me and because I, I felt like, why didn't I do something? Why didn't I do something to help? A lot, you know, some people ask me, like, when you saw this person, why didn't you just help them? But, you know, the, the, there's a whole, there were hundreds of children like this. Um, and you just don't know all their stories. And, and that's one of the things that you have to put in, the, in your mind that you know, my mission there is to share with the world what's happening to these people. It continues to happen there. 
September was one of the bloodiest months they've had so far in the conflict. And I'm trying to go back. Um, I'm waiting to get permissions and visas. Been waiting since my last trip almost a year ago. We press all the time for it. I hope that this is something that, uh, that everyone can, you know, anytime I have an opportunity to show these kind of pictures and to, 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 to share it with people, it, it's a privilege for me, and I, and I really thank everyone uh, for, your, for your attention and your time. Thank you.